But I'll, I'm Melissa Platt, Executive Director for Mental Health Association of San Mateo County, an agency that has been serving the community of San Mateo County for more than 60 years. I want to welcome you to the first of our three-part author series on schizophrenia. This is the type of program we know is critical to advancing our conversations, knowledge, and awareness about mental health and mental illness, and we are very proud to be sponsoring this. I'm extremely pleased to introduce our host and our speaker today. Angie Coiro is an award-winning radio journalist and interviewer. Her decades of experience have established her as a top-tier media personality and moderator. Angie's interview guests have ranged from Al Gore and Salman Rushdie to Bernie Sanders and Martin Short. She is currently the host of the syndicated show In Deep with Angie Coiro, as well as the host and co-producer of the This Is Now with Angie Coiro series with the Kepler's Literary Foundation. We're delighted that she is hosting all three episodes of MHA Storyteller series. Today, Angie will, will be in conversation with award-winning author, Nathan Filer. Mr. Filer trained as a psychiatric nurse, worked in mental health research and holds an honorary doctorate in liberal, liberal arts, conferred in recognition of his role in raising awareness of mental health issues through literature. He is recognized as a creative thinker, advancing the discussion of mental health and mental illness. Please feel free during the event to submit your questions in the chat box. Andy, Angie will be looking at those and responding. Please welcome Angie Coiro and Nathan Filer. Thank you. That's a lovely introduction. Thank you. Nathan, this is exciting. Thanks for joining us. It is exciting. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Angie. And uh, thank you to uh, everybody who's here watching us as well. Uh, we, can't, we can't see you, but we know you're there. We're happy <laughs> that you're here with us. As seeing people that we don't know are there, we're going to get into a lot of ideas about that. Uh, Nathan, in fact, Let's focus on schizophrenia, but first I want to ask you about why that's a focus for you. And I want to point out that, you know, in your earlier life, you've been a spoken word po poet, you know, an entertainer. And as you moved into psychiatric nursing, this took a real hold of you. Uh, schizophrenia shows up as the primary portion of your book's Shock of the Fall. Your book Heartland is focused on that. So why that particular, why schizophrenia in particular? Yeah, well, it's um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I don't, I, I would, I would sort of, I would slightly counter that um, that, that I don't know whether schizophrenia is sort of uh, look. I can, I can certainly see why you said it, and it's a fair point to make. But um, but whether schizophrenia is sort of the primary part of the the shock of the fall, I think of it as the story of a young man who is coming to terms with. Uh, grief and loss and guilt and he's got sort of complicated family dynamics and, and I think these are the, the things that I'm really interested in um, and that I'm interested in, in in both of my books people's people's stories and what's going on in their life and and depending on what goes on in your life um, sometimes this can lead to um, sometimes this can lead to, to, to what we call mental illness. I think, you know, there might be other causes as well, and we'll, we'll get into that. But, um, but this can then manifest um, uh, in, in this thing we call schizophrenia. So I think what I'm interested in is kind of, is kind of all that other stuff, um, r really. And then, and, and, and then uh, uh, about how, um, uh, how that perhaps that expresses itself in, in, in schizophrenia. So the whole person, not, not just that diagnosis. Right. Now, I want to point out, you know, I just opened our conversation with kind of a flippant remark about seeing people who weren't there, hearing voices of people who aren't there. And one of the reasons I want to put an emphasis on that is because throughout your books, you're talking about very serious stuff, but there's also some impish humor, especially in Heartland. You know, you talk about bathing your children in, in socially conscious bathwater. There's a lot of fun stuff in there. It's the and best kind. It's, it's, I, I won't use any other kind of bath water with my, <laughs> with my children. It results in I, I infinitely more enjoyable bath time conversations. Well, the reason I bring it up is I, I'm curious about the role of humor. As we get into this conversation, we're talking about some very heavy stuff. Can you talk about the role of humor, not only in discussing this, but in living with and through serious mental health illness? Sure. Well, I suppose it's important to acknowledge there that for um, 
uh, of, of course, living with mental illness means different things to, to different people. Uh, but for many people, it is a kind of suffering, you know, it is, it is you know, predominantly a very difficult thing to, to, to live through. Um, but in my experience of working with many people and, and you know, hundreds of people over, over the years, back from the time that I was working as a nurse, but, but also interviewing people for the, for the heartland and so on. Um, of course, those difficult experiences aren't the whole of people. Um, and uh, and I saw lots of lots of humour, um, and you know that was a, a, a part of a part of that work as well. And it's just really important for me too. Like humour is an important part of my life, an important part of my writing. And when you're handling, um, you know, such big, heavy, distressing subjects, I think it is important, of course, to uh, to, to 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 balance some of that and have some 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 light with the some light with the shade. Well, let's talk about the two books. Your character in *The Shock of the Fall*—that's your your fictional depiction of uh, your fictional depiction of dealing with schizophrenia—and the follow-up is *The Heartland*, which is your hands-on reports from the front about being a psychiatric nurse and what you've learned about diagnostics and language and everything afterward. Let's start with *Shock of the Fall*, and your character in there isn't diagnosed in the book. Nobody ever says this is someone with schizophrenia, but you have said that if you had to put a name to it, you were in fact writing about that. So, can you talk about the choice not to name that in the book? So, so I suppose it goes back to uh, you know what I tried to articulate, and perhaps not very clearly um, in answering your first question, which is that I'm. What I'm, what I'm interested in is people and the whole of people and their their experiences, um, and and I, I I just felt that there was a, there was sort of a danger I suppose in uh, naming it and then it just becoming about schizophrenia rather than about all these other things and and you see you know you do see that in in fiction where. Um, you know you know if somebody's sort of writing about mental illness they kind of write the mental illness. Uh, first and then almost sort of tack on the character as an afterthought but that isn't my experience of, of people that I've worked with over the years and and it wasn't um it wasn't how I wanted to write Matthew so uh, uh, Matthew Holmes is the is the character in in that book you know he's a he's a funny and resilient and brave and stoic and uh you know he's got a uh he, you know he's got a bit of an edge to him sometimes and some anger um, of course, as a as a, a result of his circumstances, but he's all of these things, um, mm -hmm. and so that's what I wanted to wanted to write about and not get too caught up in the diagnosis. But you are absolutely right that, uh, that, that if, if if I were to diagnose him, and and I don't diagnose people, I worked as a nurse, I've never diagnosed people. Um, doctors do that, but um, but if I were to if I were to diagnose him, or if a doctor were to diagnose him, then probably. Uh, they would have landed on they would have landed on schizophrenia because of the kind of experiences he was having this kind of detachment from reality the hearing voices the having very unusual uh, unusual beliefs um, mm -hmm. but these did all relate to um, what had happened to him and his and his grief and his experience and and I think that's that's really important um, for me when 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 thinking about you know, even the kind of very strange and bizarre beliefs that we that we that we might call d delusions. Um, within those is a story. You know, within it, it, people are expressing um, a narrative in some sense if they're having unusual beliefs about something. And and I and I think that um one of the one of the problems at, at, at the moment with uh, kind of modern psychiatry, and, and I think this is probably actually a bigger problem in, 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 in the States even than it is in the UK, though, though, it, though it's problematic in both of our nations, is that um, m modern psychiatry is, is sort of more interested at the moment in the sort of presence or absence of something like a delusion rather than the content. But it's in the content that I think sometimes we can begin to understand where that comes from uh, and how to help people. So these were, were some of the ideas that I was trying to explore uh, with Matthew in, in, in that book. The content of his delusions in some way gave clues as to what he was trying to process. 
Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the reputation of schizophrenia, how it's perceived. There are two different things at work here. One is that it's clearly depicted in so many ways as probably the worst or the most difficult or in some cases the most horrific kind of mental illness one can have. On the other hand, considering that it's, an, it's something where we find hard to approach, when your book was ready to publish, you had 11 bids for that book which tells me that even though it's incredibly difficult and incredibly misunderstood, people seem ready to be talking about it or that many people wouldn't have wanted to publish it. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, people are fascinated by it as well, aren't they? So you're right, it's got this, um, yeah, well, it's, it's certainly got a reputation, hasn't it? I mean, we can talk about that. It means, it, it seems to mean different things to, to different people, but yeah, it comes with, it, it comes with a gravity, doesn't it? I think, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I guess I guess people are people are fascinated. People are fascinated by that. I don't suppose that it was it, it was that alone that resulted in all those people wanting to buy to buy the books. I think it was, um, uh, um, you, you know, again, like wanting to spend time with this character and and with Matthew and all the other things that he. Uh, that he represents but um but but yeah you're right it's got a it's got a terrible reputation and 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 and, and in some ways uh rightly so um it is again i think for most people who have this diagnosis um they're suffering and suffering greatly um so 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 in so in some ways that, that that sort of um that reputation of it being a terrible thing is earned mm. um but 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 in in other ways less so and i think a lot of the the beliefs around it and these are beliefs that have been held um by the medical establishment as well as by uh, you, you know l lay people um but but those beliefs many of which now we're starting to see through uh, evidence and research um, are, are problematic. Uh, those beliefs make it worse than it needs to be. You know, mm. they, they, they it, so make it a life sentence, make it a progressive brain disease, make it, you, you know, these things which, which actually, um, these things we're starting to see now have been uh, pretty fatally undermined by the, by the research. Um, mm. So, 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 so in some ways, yet yeah, deserves that reputation. In some ways, it doesn't. And I think we can start to actually be a bit more optimistic for people who end up with this diagnosis. Well, in fact, while we're staying with reputation for just a moment, I was surprised to hear you say in an interview that that particular diagnosis makes even mental health professionals uncomfortable, that they tiptoe around that. Does that mean in terms of being willing to diagnose it or not wanting to deal with those clients? How does that manifest itself? Well, I mean, I think that I think that varies, and and that and that varies over over time. I mean, the, the you know, you go back a you go back a couple of decades ago in the in in the US, and actually, um, clinicians were pretty trigger happy with that with that diagnosis, um, and this led to some of the uh, concerns about reliability when uh, you, you know there were these sort of global studies, and we were seeing that uh, a psychiatrist in uh, in in the US might arrive at a different diagnosis to a psychiatrist in in the UK, um, or indeed uh, a psychiatrist in either of those countries might arrive at a different diagnosis to a colleague of theirs who saw the same patient ten minutes later. Um, so um, so so you know there are problems with uh, with diagnosis, but to but to yeah to to go back to your point, I think nobody wants to be the clinician who says to uh you know a, 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 a terrified mother um that their that their son's alarming and bizarre behaviors are, are schizophrenia and they, you know as i say a few decades ago probably a lot a, 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 that diagnosis was given out a, a lot more liberally um but i think clinicians are more cautious ab about that now mm. um and, and maybe talk about kind of psychosis in these sort of more general terms um, rather than, than arriving very quickly at a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And, and, and I think it's right to be cautious about using it, um, but partly because um, it is such a contested diagnosis. You know, there's, there's no um, consensus 
of opinion among you know across the fields of sort of psychiatry psychology uh, neuroscience genetics um uh, and, and 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 other sort of interested parties there's no consensus of opinion over really anything about this diagnosis from uh, you, you know sort of causes treatments outcomes whether it's out used it, it uh, um, outlasted its usefulness whether it ever was useful whether we should abandon it so so so, so it's right with all of that controversy um perhaps to tiptoe around it a little bit, or, or if not to tiptoe around it, to make it very clear when using that diagnosis um, uh, that, it, that it's controversial and that there isn't that consensus. In fact, when you mentioned both diagnos diagnostics and causes, you think that we may focus a little too much on diagnosis over causes. We don't talk enough about the causes of schizophrenia and you really go into some political areas here. You're talking about sociology, economy. Um, you're will, I've even heard you mention Ronald Reagan. Um, and yeah. talking about, <laughs> you know, the causes of schizophrenia. What, what is that reluctance to look at it in the whole picture? Well, I, I, I think that's partly p political, the reluctance. And, and these views go in and out of fashion because actually, um, you know, psychiatry for a, a, a long time was 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 very interested in those kind of discussions. You know, if we think about Freud, and you know, that was all very much about your family and your relationships and those, you know, what you might think of those sort of psychological and social causes. Um, why that fell out of favour, um, and I, I explore this um, a, a, a little bit in the book actually, but. Um, uh, but, but there were a few, there were a few things that happened that that came together, um, and one was that sort of being bo born out of that uh, maybe Freudian approach, um, like psychiatrists started. Um, well, I'll just be blunt about it. Uh, psychi not psychiatrists. Psychiatry as an institution started to blame mothers they started to blame family members there was this sort of concept um of the schizophrenogenic mother yeah so um which was you know actually pretty sort of sexist and 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 and, and chauvinistic and and you know mothers could do nothing right you know they either cause their child to become schizophrenic by not loving them enough or they cause them to be schizophrenic by loving them too much yeah um and uh, understandably uh, families didn't like this, um, and so and and so groups started to form lobbying groups, including and uh, I mean predominantly actually in 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 the in the states. This is a big part of your history of mental illness, because um, uh, is it NAMI or something? National Association of Mental Illness. I think I think is that mm -hmm. I'm a little out of my comfort comfort zone, but um, uh, you, you know they they push back against that. Um, and 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 sort of push towards this more biological way of thinking about uh, of thinking about distress and mental illness. They didn't want the blame. You can understand why they didn't want the blame. The blame was being put on them unfairly. So they pushed back against that. Now there were other forces at play because drug companies also were very happy with this alternative narrative that oh no it's got nothing to do with anything except a, a biochemical imbalance in the brain and we're the people to put that right so they kind of you know joined joined forces um and and together um fr from around the kind of 1980s that meant the pendulum swung really really far in the other direction um, and 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 I think um, so, so. I think that that mo that place we find ourselves now, where we talk predominantly about biological causes, about chemical imbalances, is is all sort of born of that long uh, history, where it's part of psychiatry's sort of shameful hangover from having invented this schizophrenogenic mother. We don't want to blame families anymore, and so that becomes a taboo to talk about that at all. And of course, really what we've got to do is acknowledge that you no, know, all of these things are important. Of course, the biology is important. Of course, those ke the, the chemicals in our brain, of course, our genes, that's all part of it. But so 
to are these other things and and we're, and we're not doing anyone um a service if we if we, if we just sort of ignore that if we ignore that completely you know we know for instance that that, that childhood adversity um so so being in a household where uh, perhaps you're exposed to um to, to abuse be it uh, sort of verbal physical sexual abuse uh witnessing parental conflict um, drugs and alcohol abuse in the house, a child growing up in those conditions is far more likely to, to become psychotic or have any number of uh, mental illness diagnoses um, uh, than, than, than someone who isn't. So it doesn't, it doesn't explain the whole picture, um, but it's important that we think about those things too. God, there's so much to unpack there. There's yeah, so sorry. I give <laughs> no, no. This, is, this, is, this is how complex it gets. Uh, first, I want to I'm throw sorry. in. Sorry, you ask. I, 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 I'll keep my answers a bit shorter. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Believe me, that was not a criticism. I love it. I do want to throw in a comment from Craig, who says 58 years ago, a psychiatrist told my mother that she and I, a four year old, were the cause of my brother's schizophrenia. So at least we've gotten away from that. Yeah, and at least we and at least we have. Sorry, what was that that guy's name? Did you say Craig? Craig. Craig mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it, exactly, Craig. And at least we've gotten away from that. And and you know that was a, that was a a, a a terrible thing for for you to hear and for your and for your mother to to hear. And I think you know this is a really important point actually when when talking about causes. And and I think that this gets. Um, this, this sort of gets overlooked or it's not communicated well enough to people. And it is this, that the science is not at a point where any individual clinician, you know, of, of any stripes, doctors, nurses, psychologists, whatever, can tell an individual person what caused them to develop schizophrenia or indeed what calls them to develop anxiety or depression or bipolar or, or, or whatever. We are not at that point. What, what we can look at are trends at a population level. So when I say that childhood adversity um, is, uh, looks to be a cause, what I mean is there is a strong correlation and we can see when looking at large numbers of people that it increases the odds. And the same with many other things, you know, like uh, uh, po uh, poverty, uh, for instance, or relative poverty. Um, uh, the, these, things, uh, these things increase your likelihood. But for a clinician to say to Craig and say to his mother, uh, that they'd caused it. That's that's a you know apart from being a horrible thing to say. That's just that's just a nonsense. Nobody could uh, uh, nobody could know could know that. Nicholas says a diagnosis of schizophrenia means you don't get proper treatment of physical health problems. Is that your experience? Is that what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, Nicola, did you say? Yeah, yeah, of of, of course. And I mean, this is one of the sort of great tragedies, really, about. Um, a, a, about a healthcare system that that perhaps separates these things too much, you know, so it sort of separates mental health from uh, physical health instead of looking at the at the whole person. But but yeah, I mean, a, a diagnosis of schizophrenia significantly shortens people's life expectancy, and and and, and that will that, that will relate to to to, to, to many things. It's, it's it's never so easy to to just you know look at cause and effect. Again, we're talking about sort of correlation. Um, but, um, but, but, but that will be a part of it. I think that people with that diagnosis, they perhaps go to see their, their doctor, um, and things that are, are physical problems perhaps get written off or not look, looked into in the same, in, in the same depth. Um, and, and, you know, perhaps it's seen as somehow symptomatic or r related to the, to, the, to the mental health. So there's just a, a, a lesser engagement. As I say, there'll be other reasons. Perhaps these people might be less inclined uh, to seek that help and, 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 and so on. But, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, no, she's absolutely right. I want to talk about the language that we use around mental health, not just schizophrenia, but, but language all around mental health. And I've got a little quiz for you. Oh, if, you could, if you could strike the least helpful terms out of our discussions of mental health, what would you take aim at? Well, that's a really good question. I'm, one of the things I say in, in my book is that there is no uncontroversial language when talking about mental illness 
and that includes the phrase mental illness. I, I think all, all of these terms need to be looked at with a, a, a little bit of uh, scepticism and we need to be sure that we're defining our terms and talking about the and talking about the same things and 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 that controversy you know we can get to the most controversial ones but but you know that controversy is is sort of everywhere you, you know I, I i sometimes talk about um the the collective uh the collective name for what we call people who use mental health services so what might you call those you might call them patients yeah patients that's not a that's not a controversial term surely well if you are somebody who's suffering from uh, mental distress, uh, unusual thoughts, feelings and behaviours, that's what we're talking about when we talk about mental illness, we'll always talk about thoughts, feelings and behaviours. So if you're someone who's experiencing distressing, unusual thoughts, feelings and behaviours, and you consider that to be um, uh, part of an illness, presumably existing in your brain, but the same as physical illness, well then, of course, you'd be happy to be called a patient, called right. the same thing that someone being treated for cancer or, or a broken leg, yeah, because you're a patient, just like them. However, if you take the view, as many people do, um, that even your most alarming and distressing and uncharacteristic thoughts, feelings and behaviours are not symptomatic of some underlying sort of brain illness or disease, but are maybe a way of processing undischarged trauma or unbearable life events, uh, or indeed are just uh, a, a, a sort of a, a different way of being, part of your character, then to see that wrapped up in a medical language that begins with you being called a patient might be problematic. And so in the UK, we had this term service user, which we use um, and, and, that, and that sort of brings its own controversy. We can go on and on. So, so, so I, I just make the point to say all terms are controversial. So, so, uh, so in, uh, but in terms of the, the absolute sort of worst offenders, schizophrenia may well be one of them. And, and in my book, um, I, I don't use the word schizophrenia. I use the term so-called schizophrenia. And I use that to try and acknowledge some of that uncertainty in the science and, and, and to try and be respectful of people who take comfort in that diagnosis, of which there are some, you know, that, it, it, um, or take comfort in the language of diagnosis, but also people who feel they've been injured by that language of diagnosis. Um, so, 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 so that's why that's why I use it. But broadly speaking, I think we could get away from. There's not a reason to use these diagnoses all the time, is there? You know, we don't, we don't, we don't need to. We don't need to constantly label people. Um, it's useful sometimes for getting access to care, but but I think perhaps it's overused. Just, I'm looking at the at the connection between a diagnosis and proper, if you if you care to move into medication, proper medication. Um, and for example, if, if you're diagnosed as depressed, there are medications that are advertised for that, depending on whether they actually work or not. But if your diagnosis changed and you are suddenly you know, found to be bipolar, that medication is going to change. There's a certain usefulness to that. Yeah. So look, 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 X no, diagnosis no. equals X medication. Well, where does that fall apart? No, that's so. So that's so exactly, and um, yeah, and that is the uh, yeah. I completely agree with that point. So, so it's useful. Diagnosis is useful when it when it signposts towards like relevant, helpful services and treatment. But that that is still not the same as um, saying that um, that like it it it, it definitely is some. Uh, okay, look, d d d diagnosis sometimes sort of implicitly points to, 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 to kind of causes or, um, uh, and, and, and we've talked about some of the, uh, some of, some of, some of the problems with, with that. Um, I think that for a diagnosis to be useful, to point towards some, to point towards some help, yes, that's, that's great, but that's not the same as that diagnosis necessarily being scientifically robust and 
valid and we know there are problems with the validity of psychiatric diagnosis like we 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 we, we know this and 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 it's partly um because it's incredibly complicated the, the brain is incredibly complicated it's yes. difficult to arrive at these things i'm not sort of trying to sort of trash talk the people who are trying they've got a really really difficult job um and and so so but what what these diagnoses are is okay i'll go back a a, 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 a little step um it's probably not appreciated by uh, many people that there are no um, objective biological tests for the vast majority of what we call the mental illnesses. So when we give someone this diagnosis of depression or bipolar or schizophrenia or whatever, nobody has done a brain scan or a blood test or anything of the sort to arrive at that diagnosis. Rather, these are the names we give to human experiences that often seem to cluster together. So, you, you know, we could we, we could do a diagnosis now, couldn't we? If, if you, you tell me, you'd be, you be the doctor, uh, Angie. So, so imagine a young child is in the classroom and uh, they find it uh, difficult to pay attention to what the teacher is saying. Uh, they interrupt quite often. They fidget in their, they fidget in their seat uh, and, the, and the teacher notices this. What, what, what diagnosis might uh, be arrived at for them? I would say that's a child. Oh, well, you are. A child being a child. <laughs> well, you are. Well, you are absolutely right. To, Angie, you are absolutely right to say that it's a child being a child. Um, and yet we have an explosion, don't we, of this diagnosis of ADHD. Yeah. Um, and uh, and where where these kind of uh, in this case behaviours are seen in a way, and this diagnosis has arrived at. That is fascinating what you said, because actually we know that the youngest child in a classroom is more than twice as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than the oldest child in the classroom. Now, does that mean they're more than twice as likely to have some sort of brain abnormality? No, of course not. Does it mean that they're five years old instead of six years old? Well, yes, it does. So the danger there is that we sort of turn immaturity into a disease and that has happened to, um, to an extent. Uh, but my point is uh, we see those behaviours and arrive at that diagnosis and that's how it goes for all the other diagnoses. So a terrified adolescent uh, who is hearing voices might also have strange beliefs. Um, his parents say that he's withdrawn from his friends. And we see those thoughts and feelings. We see that story often enough uh, that we give it a name and we give that story the name of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so, uh, but, 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 but the problem with this sort of way of diagnosing, of, 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 of putting these experiences into boxes and giving them labels like schizophrenia and bipolar, is human experiences don't really like to be placed in boxes and they often have quite blurry edges. And traditional psychiatrists' response to that, certainly since the, the 1980s, um, has been to create more and more and more of these boxes. So something looks a bit like schizophrenia and a bit, bi bit like bipolar, well, then the diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder is born. Um, and, and, and so you can see how this starts to be problematic. What's the end point here? Do we just start to kind of diagnose all human behaviour? And, 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 you know, this is what sort of critics of this, um, of this diagnostic system say you know we're going to have a disorder for everyone in the end um, yes but, but look i'm not completely anti it i'm not at all it can be very very helpful uh for for many people for the reasons you've said uh such as uh getting access to care and treatment that's not the same as it being scientifically robust a uh, question from lisa what are your thoughts on therapy for example cbt cognitive behavioral therapy my perception through talking to people about practical issues for people who regularly experience psychosis, but it's barely offered here in the north of the UK. 
I've read papers and read an NHS training course that suggests it can be helpful. Yeah, so CBT for uh, for psychosis. So one of the um, the people that I interviewed in uh, in the Heartland uh, was, I mean, he was just absolutely the most amazing person. Really, he was um, a, a, a mental health nurse who himself hears voices, um, and he's heard voices his whole life. Uh, but he's uh, he he works in uh, in a secure hospital helping other people who um, hear more extreme voices and, and uh, you, you know, much more unwell than, than he's been. Um, and he delivers uh, what's called CBTP, the CBT for, for psychosis. Um, how he described it to me um, was that uh, if you try to measure its effectiveness in terms of sort of ameliorating uh, quote unquote symptoms. So, so getting rid of, for instance, psychotic voices, um, then it's not uh, necessarily very effective. However, um, but also, I mean, lots of the medications aren't either, um, some perhaps more so than others. Um, however, if you measure it in terms of reduction in uh, stress, and people's ability to manage their relationship with their voices, um, well then the outcomes are much, much better and it starts to look like a much better treatment option. So, so you might think of it, you know, I, I think he drew a parallel for me of um, if, you, if you were being bullied at school, you know, um, but, and, and the bully was sort of making your life a misery, but then someone was able to help you realize that the bully couldn't really hurt you. They weren't really going to, to you know, do the horrible things that, that, that it might be saying. Well, that doesn't make the bully go away, but it does change your relationship with that mm -hmm. experience. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm going to take you into one of your particular soft spots here. And I do want to recommend to everyone who's, who's been tuned in today, uh, if you go to the BBC website or you just go to Google and enter BBC for Nathan Filer, you're going to come across an excellent program called The Mind in the Media. And part of what came up, Nathan, in The Mind in the Media, which, which you do a superb job in, was talking about the vestiges of the imagery in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And when we're talking about what effective treatments are, if you look at electroconvulsive therapy, which shows a great deal of promise, it's not what's depicted in there, but there's that persistent image first from the book and then from an incredibly successful movie that is still showing everywhere. That carries a huge price, carries a huge price. Yeah, yeah, you probably can't sort of overstate the, the legacy of, um, of, of that book and film, can you? And I mean, they're great as well, aren't they? So, um, uh, and just a big part of popular culture, but um, yeah, it probably is a shame what it's done to, uh, to ECT, to uh, uh, to that therapy. I mean, as a as a nurse, I was involved. You know, I would go into the ECT suite with patients uh, having that treatment for um, treatment resistant depression. I, only a few times, not 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 many times, but um, but the experience of those patients um, was that it was extremely helpful. You know, extremely extremely helpful, and 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 lifted them. Uh, helped to lift them out of a depression that, that, the, that the drugs weren't touching and the other interventions weren't weren't touching. Um, so, so yeah, it's probably a shame that it's got the rep reputation that has in some ways. I think because in the film, of course, they're awake when they have it, aren't they? But um, but but that isn't that isn't the case really. You're put under general anaesthetic. So, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I mean, for some, you, you, you know, in some ways, you could think of it as a less invasive treatment than some of the chemicals, couldn't you? Um, yeah, now that you bring it up, yeah. You're not putting anything in your body. Uh, do you see any romanticizing of mental illness? The reason I ask this is because frequently when you look back at creative figures, Vincent Van Gogh, when you look at people who notoriously or, or very publicly suffered mental illness, there's sometimes a softening of the edges or sometimes a, he's so brilliant because he was mentally ill. We'll occasionally in modern times, we'll hear pop songs 
that seem to make mental illness seem like a bonding sort of thing. I like that you're broken like me. So do you see a romanticization of, of mental illness? Well, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And we, uh, to, to, yes, to a degree in terms of you're saying that sort of link between <coughs> sort of genius and madness or, or what have you. I feel, you know, it feels a bit cruel to me. I feel like people with, uh, you know, suffering these kind of experiences have got enough going on without feeling that they've got to, got to be an artistic genius as well. You know, it's sort of, you know, like of course for most people aren't going to be in way and why should they, and why should they be? Um, it, I, I think it's interesting in terms of some of those political uh, sort of considerations um, as, as well, really, how um, in some ways um, some mental health diagnoses can feel not dissimilar these days to brands, you know, so with the with the sort of currently more uh, sort of popular brands getting m more attention uh, and resources. So if we think about depression and anxiety, you know, they're having a real sort of boom in a way, aren't they? There's loads of self-help books around them, loads of new therapies um, developing. Um, well, the, and, and, and when I say sort of, when I say popular, I don't mean they're, I, of course, I don't mean they're like fun to experience. I just mean that they, you, you know, you, of course they're not, but there's just all of those resources. They're sort of, ha depression and anxiety is sort of having their moment. Um, but, but, but the less, uh, the less popular brands then, like schizophrenia, uh, like um, the sort of the per the, the, the so-called personality disorders, um, they sort of get left behind, and then this and then this additional uh, in 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 uh, sort of inequity forms. Um, God, I do waffle, don't I, Angie? I do very long meandering <laughs> answers to your to your questions. It's a little bit of nervousness. Can I say to your listeners, it is a little bit of nervousness. I, uh, to, to, to our, our viewers, I, I just, I, I haven't, it's very unusual to do this, to do, a, to do a talk where you can't see anyone in the audience and, and it feels, yeah, just a, a, a little bit alien. I'm a bit nervous. I've not talked about these books for, for a little while. So, um, so I apologize for the, uh, for, for the, for the rambling. Well, on the receiving end of this, there's nothing to apologize for. But I do have to point out, in Heartland, you describe yourself as an unnerved, frightened, anxious man. So maybe we saw just a little glimpse of that just now. <laughs> I am <laughs> that. <laughs> there's something we have in the U.S. that I, I don't think, correct me, that you don't have in the U.K., which is direct-to-consumer advertising of pharmaceuticals. And rather than dealing with anxiety, or depression, what we see is a happy little blob with a little sad face, and then he gets this medication. Now he's a happy little blob with a, with a grin. And to watch these depictions, this oversimplification, now this is my opinion here, to bring in this oversimplification of medicating, this oversimplification of diagnosis, I just want to hear your thoughts on direct-to-consumer advertising for this. Yeah, so it's not something that um, yeah, it's not something I've ever seen here. Of course, we don't um, we, yeah, we we don't we don't have that. I've not yeah, I've not really thought about it so much. But I guess it's um, you know, it's a big business, isn't it? You know, the psychopharmaceutical industry is a is a big big industry. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it, how does it feel inherently? That feels problematic to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, how does it feel to you? <laughs> Well, I noticed some doctors, it feels terrible because they come in and, you know, they, they meet a new client. The client says, you know, I've seen this on TV, so I think I have this. Maybe that's a good starting point. Maybe that's a conversation starter, but I know that some doctors are not that thrilled with it. Mm, yeah, that sort of uh, ask your doctor for a reason to take it kind of advertising. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh, got a lot of questions coming in. By the way, uh, the BBC Four program that I mentioned earlier, the the Angels of the Chat Room, have put that link up there, so you can find it in the chat room. Kathy says, "My son was diagnosed one year ago with schizophrenia. He won't talk to us about his voices to really understand the content of them. He only says they're really bad. So trying to help understand is whether we, is how we push him to open up." Our son was adopted at birth with no background on the father. Not that this would change his diagnosis, 
He was diagnosed with Asperger's at the age of five. How often do you see a correlation between those two? Oh gosh, I mean, it's such a it's such a big question, and I'm you know I'm you know sorry that you're having such a difficult time, and that your and that your son is. Um, I, I, I don't know, actually, you know, I'm very, I think when, again, that point of dealing with sort of individual people, I'd just be so reluctant to sort of say something that, that you, what was the lady's name? Sorry, I didn't catch her name. That was Kathy. 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 That, yeah, that Kathy would, would, would sort of take, take away and hold on to because I'm just not, I'm not an expert on, um, on that. I, I, I believe um, that from what little bits I've read that there is, um, uh, yeah, there is some sort of correlation be between those sort of um, uh, autistic spectrum disorders and psychosis. I think that uh, I think that, that exists. Um, but but Kathy, I'm, I'm yeah. I just I don't want to sort of I, I step outside of my knowledge there. I'm, I'm uh, but but you know what it does sound like is that you need to talk to somebody um, and 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 get some and get some more expert expert advice on on that. Um, I don't know what's sort of happening after uh, after this session with so many people here. You feel that there could be a maybe somebody else in the audience could give Kathy a better answer than I can. Well, in fact, someone's asking about community. There's another question coming in, and and I do want to ask it, but I also want to give some leavening to this. We're hearing from some people who are in very difficult spots with this. So just to leaven that a bit, schizophrenia is not a hopeless thing. There are happy people who are living productive lives even though some of them may have relapses, some of them don't, they've found ways to cope. So I think we want to get it out there. This is not some doomsday no, diagnosis. No, and it really, really, it really isn't. So, um, it, it, you know, I, so, so again, partly this is about defining our terms um, because um, recovery means different things to different people. Uh, for some people, the word uh, re recovery would mean a complete remission of clinical symptoms, yeah, what we might think of as a kind of medical recovery. For some people, recovery might not mean that, but it might be um, a way of processing, not returning to the state you were in before this huge thing happened, but but growing in some way because of that and attributing meaning to those experiences over time, yeah? So that's a sort of different way of thinking about recovery. There are some people who uh, reject the term completely and see it as a, as a sort of term used by mental health services to kind of further co-opt and control people uh, and argue that um, the kind of autonomy uh, and independence arguably at the heart of any recovery cannot be kind of calibrated by outcome measures. So we can see it means many different things, but irregardless, whatever metric you choose to measure it by, being that kind of medical or more deeply personal, recovery can and frequently does happen. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully that com comes from my book, you know, I interview a, a, a number of people, of course, some of those stories have, have sadder endings than, than, than others. Um, but, but, but yeah, for, 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 for many people, uh, recovery happens and people go on to, uh, to, to lead meaningful and happy lives. One of the stories that you have in the book, you focus on Kate and her mother, Bridget. And her mother, Bridget, was the one with the diagnosis, but her daughter obviously had all of her own problems growing up with a mother like that. And I thought it painted a very strong and solid picture of how one goes through that, one does end up having a good life, but still dealing with the vestiges of that. And, and I thought you depicted her very strongly in the fact that while she's very accomplished and she's leading a good life, there are areas that she still kind of doesn't want to touch. So, so like most of us who go through any kind of trauma, it's not going to be erased, but you find a way to kind of tuck that into to the way you're living now. Yeah, and maybe to and and maybe to grow from it in some ways as well. You know that you, you know these big experiences they change us, and we can we can we can sort of grow from them as well, can't we? So. Um, but yeah, and I mean that's the stuff of life, isn't it? You know, it's not just in the in the way. You know, when I 
was talking about ADHD and I said, you know, what would you, what you call that person? And you'd say, well, I'd call them a child. It's like, well, having a, having a, 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 a sort of complex and messy experiences. Well, you know, that, that, that's part of just what we'd call a life as well, isn't it? And um, yeah. yeah, it's probably never going to be uh, as, as, as neat and uh, as neat as perhaps we'd want it. Uh, Nicholas says, I have a 30 year old son who's schizophrenic and bipolar. He lives at home with his mother and has very limited interactions with other people. He doesn't make friends easily. He's fairly isolated with COVID restrictions making it work. COVID restrictions are making everything worse right now. Is there a chat room, he says, or some way for increased socialization? I feel people with severe and persistent mental illness don't get enough interaction. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think that I think the organisers of this event would be better placed to say what kind of resources, um, what kind of resources are over there. But if there's one, um, you're, you're right that COVID's making everything worse, isn't it? But perhaps if there's one tiny silver lining, uh, this kind of additional time that we're spending on line perhaps more communities and conversations are are forming and it's a way that people can still uh can still c connect but of course really what we want is for this uh for this man to be able to to, to get out and socialize and do those things that, that that we all that we all need to do i mean it's such a the kind of lockdowns and everything it's challenging for for everyone and so for people who have underlying mental health problems of, of, of course always then they're, they're the people who suffer more greatly aren't they at, the, at these at these times uh, i want to note that we do have people tuned in from around the world locally you can check out mha's website the mental health association website in san mateo county for more resources so that's for our local folks we also have someone who noted that in the uk there's bipolar uk you don't have to be in the uk Obviously, there's a time difference to consider. For thank you very much for that, Lisa. She says it's it's a very nice forum from what she's used. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, let's talk about stigma. I know that we all work very hard to get rid of the stigma of of mental health illness. I've actually professionally tried very hard to do that. I, I disclose my own issues with mental illness. You know, I, I talk very publicly about it. I see other people of various levels of prominence who get right out there and say, this is what I'm dealing with. And that seems to be on the increase. So tell me where the fight against stigma might be improved. Yeah, so it's definitely on the on the increase. And I think, um, and yeah, so I uh, would like commend you that you've that you've done that. And to, to people who've done that, I think that's really, really important to uh, sort of normalize that, that conversation. Um, uh, and and I think that um, uh, that has now significantly broadened that conversation, and I think it's removed um, in, in 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 some sections of society all but eradicated the stigma around certain mental health experiences. So again, uh, perhaps depression and anxiety. Uh, mostly, so I think um, I think now there is not across all of society, but across some sections of society, uh, the, the the sort of stigma around that is probably even pretty pretty much dealt with actually, um, which is which is great. Um, so so I think we've significantly broadened that conversation. What what I argue is we now need to deepen it. And, and this comes back again to some of the some of the sort of uh, politics and some of the the kind of social causes for um, uh, for, for what we call mental illness. Um, the, the the standard anti-stigma campaign message that's sort of been around for for, for years um, equates uh, mental illness with uh say a broken leg yeah so you wouldn't tell me to pull myself together if i had a broken leg so don't tell me to pull myself together because i've got schizophrenia or because i uh, uh, got, bi got bipolar um and and that may, that does make sense to an to an extent and it's certainly like very well meaning but it but it arguably individualizes something that is a social problem or at least can be a 
um, a social problem. So again, those sort of causes around like poverty, uh, around uh, uh, adverse childhood uh, events and so on. Um, we, we don't talk about um, the stigma of being a woman. We don't talk about the stigma of being black. We talk quite rightly about sexism and racism. Yeah. And, 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 and so this is where maybe there's something there a little bit that we need to reconceptualize when we're talking about the about the stigma of mental illness as well, because because because, you know, you could make uh, this this point uh, that, that the, the, some of this conversation around uh, around stigma and being able to talk freely about having anxiety and 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 being able to sort of to yeah to be to kind of uh, own that and be open about it and saying well this is this is my anxiety the, the, it, it it turns our attention in the wrong direction and and it may we, we have to ask whose interest does that serve because you, you know it may serve the interests of people in positions of political power that uh, a young millennial who is struggling to pay their rent uh, with ever increasing sort of rent prices and they're paying two thirds of their salary on a zero hours contract uh, in order to have this sort of, you know, mouldy room in a shared flat somewhere. Um, it, 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 it may serve the interests of people in positions of political power that that person is suffering from a panic disorder, yeah, uh, and that they would happily speak about that and there's no stigma associated with that rather than countenance the possibility that, that, that the real sickness is elsewhere. So, yeah. so I think that's where um, it, it's brilliant that, that we're talking so much more about mental, uh, 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 about mental health and mental illness. Uh, we broaden that conversation, but now we need to dig in and deepen it. We are sliding toward the end of our conversation and I want to apologize to those of you whose questions we haven't gotten to, but there are resource, resources there for you. If you're in the U.S., you can look to your local chapter of NAMI, N-A-M-I, for support. That's N-A-M-I.org. You can check those out there. We want to look now, you and I, at how things have changed since it's been almost a decade since Shock of the Fall came out. It's been three years since Heartland has come out. Tell me how you've seen any of the dialogue change, if it has, around mental illness. What sort of progress have you seen in looking a little more skeptically at diagnoses and causes. Are you seeing any shifts in those things? Well, I, I, I think probably, um, you know, it's been funny as I've been, you know, the side of the argument that I've sort of presented in, in this discussion has um, probably been more aligned to yet yeah, that kind of uh, the, the social psychological causes. I, I actually feel, you know, there's so much to learn from the, the hard science as well. I'm really interested in uh, in the genetics, in the in the neuroscience, I am not one of these people that that sort of denies that that, that is important. I think it's it's you know it's 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 a, it's crucial. Um, I, I I think that um, where the progress will be made and is perhaps just starting to be made is to um, is for for all of those sort of groups of professionals to uh, to to listen to each other. Respectfully, and to uh, and 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 to see that, that, that all of these theories have something relevant to say, rather than than conclude it must only be one thing or, or, or only another. Uh, so, as again, it's about isn't it sort of seeing the seeing the whole person. What I was hoping to do uh, with with those books, but certainly um, certainly the second book with the Heartland uh, was just try and be part of that that conversation and be open to, to, to all, all of that. And, and, and I think that happens when you come back to the personal stories. So, you know, for instance, um, I interviewed one person in the book um, who felt that medication that her son had taken, antipsychotic medication, had contributed to his death, really. You know, she felt that um, 
uh, that that played a major role in um, in in him uh, dying at, at a very young age. I spoke to another person who feels who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and feels that um, that medication has saved her and allowed her to live a, a sort of full and happy life. So look, Angie, both of those things are true. We don't need to say that it's definitely bad or that it's definitely good. We've got there two people who have two different experiences. So where I see the conversation getting better is when we start to be kind of less ideologically driven and just listen, hear the person's experience, hear their truth and proceed with that as the starting point. I knew this was gonna to go too fast. It went by way too fast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, Again, I feel I waffled a bit, but, uh, but, but, but <laughs> thank you. I'll send you a report card. We'll work on it. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. And we'll toss it on back to Melissa. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, Sol Mateo, for helping to make this event possible. Please remember the second part of the series will take place on April 1, so please register if you haven't already done so. If you would like more information about the series, about Mental Health Association, or how to support programs like this, please check out our website, which was in the chat box. Uh, a link to this recording will be made available to you and sent next week. So again, thank you, Angie. Thank you, Nathan. This has been amazing. And we hope to see most of you or all of you on April 1st. Thank you. Thank you.